we are in a period of generational, people call it generational shift or change. <laughs> Hallelujah. We have seen the end of an era. We are witnessing the beginning of a new one. Remember all of this from last week? For us, individually and collectively as a church, and I'm talking about the church of God globally, and for our nation here and the nations of the world, this is a significant time. Amen. These are words I want you to keep in your heart as we move on this morning. Now, to start, open with me to Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Chapter one. And I'm just going to read verse four because of our time. One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. Amen. One generation passes away and Another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. Hallelujah. And the word abides forever is actually used in that in a limited sense, because we know that this world is not going to abide forever. <laughs> this is stage, but actually it's used in the context of the fact that uh, till the King of Kings and the Lord of Lord returns, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Are you getting me? Every actor on stage will leave the stage at some point, no matter how long. Mm. Hallelujah. It is a statement of fact. As we witness the exit of a well-respected monarch, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. She served for many years, didn't she? But at some point, every actor will leave the stage. Amen. Let that be one of the key lessons we learn. We'll leave the stage for some other people. No matter how good a generation is or how bad a generation is, they will leave the stage yet for another. That's the sense in which I want us to see that context. Hallelujah. And I'm praying that the Lord will help us at this hour to see the importance of this time that we are in, in Jesus' name. Amen. I wouldn't preach the same message we preached last week. Anyone who missed last week should go and listen to the message because it prepares the ground for what we're going to be saying today. Brothers and sisters, the message I will be pushing a little bit today is titled, Racing a Great Generation. 
raising a great generation. I have discovered from looking at the Bible, the word of God, that every generation is defined by some attributes. Hallelujah. There are attributes that qualify every generation, whether they be great or otherwise. As I just look at what the scripture says about generations, and I'll be telling you some things about that. Hallelujah. There are defining attributes for every generation. It does not necessarily mean that everyone will imbibe those attitude, attributes, but however, the majority of the people living at a particular time and period of life, are you getting me? There are attributes that would define them and their generation. And because it is their attributes embraced, imbibed, and exhibited by the majority, they tend to have influence over the generation. Are you getting the point I'm making this morning? The greatness of a generation will depend on the qualities, the character traits of the majority of the people of that generation, especially those who lead them. Are you getting the point I'm making? Hallelujah. And I'm going to just trace for you quickly how the scripture describes some generation. And I will see where we can stop today and continue. But the task that I see before us as God's people at this hour is about raising a great generation. It's about bringing up a great generation according to God. But let's look at a few generations as described by the Bible, and you will understand what I'm saying. By a generation being described by the attribute, the predominant attributes of people in that generation. It is not just about those who were born. Yes, there will be people who were born and who live around about the same time. With shared experiences, shared exposures, which will define other parts, other things about them, which I will go into shortly. But let's look at a few generations as we go on. Let's look at, you will, you will see the, the, the generation, if you look at the Bible, the generation of Joshua, for instance, was a great, you, you will describe that generation as a great generation, wouldn't you? You will. There are a number of things or quality that characterize that generation. I'll just be picking a few of them, maybe one or two of them. And you can say that of some generation. But let's look at what this is about. Turn with me quickly to Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2. In Judges chapter 2, Judges chapter 2, I'll read from verse 7. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Can you see that? So there's, there is this generation, if I'm to ask you, what do you think characterized that generation? 
the generation that Joshua and the elders and the people about his age who belong to his own generation led. What was it that characterized that generation? Someone to unmute and just say something. Do we know? I don't want to waste time on that. Do we they know? Served, they served God. They served the Lord. They served the Lord. So we are talking about a generation given to service. Are you getting me? They served. So if you want to look at that generation, they were a generation who knew what it meant to serve and to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. They served. They were given to service. They served the Lord. They served their generation. Are you getting me? So there was something about them. They served. And look at something there. And what was it that made them to serve? What was it that actually was underlining that attribute of service? The Bible clearly tells us there. And what was that? Do you know? Yeah? Does anyone know? They've seen the great works of God. They saw, they saw the great work of God. There was something they saw. They witnessed something. And that made them to commit themselves to the service of the Lord. They served based on what they were exposed to. They saw the great work of God. They saw what the Lord did. Amen. And the reason they will see that was because a people before the people before them had done something to to bring them into that reality of God. Hallelujah. They saw the reality of who God is. That's, that's exactly the way to picture it. So their attitude to life was dictated by what they had seen. Look at what happened next. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 100 and 10 years old. Like I told you, every actor will go. Once Joshua was a young man, you remember? The young man. The assistant of Moses. But here he became old. Brothers and sisters, life is never stagnant. Life is ever moving and progressing. You are young today, you'll be old tomorrow. Amen. But that comes for something. And I just want us to, to see this. Life is not waiting for anyone. And let's go home. And they buried him with, within the borders of the inheritance at Timnah Heras in the mountains of Ephraim on the north side of Mangar. So it was a man described as the servant of the Lord, service. Do you understand? We had a servant of the Lord who led the nation and everyone bought into his attitude of service. Selfless service. Hallelujah. If you hear all the things that people are saying about the coin, they are just talking about someone who was, who was on duty, who served. I'm sure that's, that's the that's the summary of what people were saying about, about her, isn't it? So we saw a Joshua here, a leader in his own time, who said. But look at what happened next. When all that generation, just to tell you that we are talking about a generation. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord not the work which he had done for Israel. 
So we are now seeing a generation who did not know the Lord, no encounter with God, no experience of God. Hallelujah. That's another, gen that's another generation. So the generation that knew the Lord, served the Lord, saw the great work of God, left the same. And we had another generation who did not know the Lord. That was significant, isn't it? And their lack of knowledge of God, you may think, yeah, that was it. Whether they knew God or they don't know God, what does that mean? <laughs> it means a lot. Oh, I am praying that the Lord will give us understanding here in Jesus' name. Something happened. And this new generation rose up and they knew not the Lord. Let's look at the consequence of that. Just that. Because of our time, we are running through something. There was a consequence to their lack of the knowledge of the Lord. And if you want to see that, turn with me quickly to Judges. Judges, in Judges chapter 17 to start with, you will see a very, go and read Judges chapter 17, you will see a very pathetic story there. A very ugly story there. Hallelujah. And then you go on. And then on and on, if you just read on and on and on, you will understand from that chapter 17 of Judges. Just keep on reading on to chapter 18, 19, and going on. And you will see what happened because of that generation. But let's read verse 6 alone. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Do you understand that? So that generation led to what will you call it? A state of where everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Lawlessness, disorder, chaos. Are you getting me? Everyone became a law to himself. Whatever I think is right for me is what I'm going to do. Hallelujah. You may say it's a liberal generation, but the consequences were great. If you read on. May God help us in Jesus' name, because something was missing. They knew not the Lord. They knew not the Lord. How that happened is another thing entirely. Because the desire of God, according to Psalm 145, let's go to Psalm 145. In Psalm 145, the desire of God from one generation to another is this. Verse 3 says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Look at verse 4. One generation shall praise your work to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Are you getting me? One generation shall praise your work to another. So how come a generation arose that did not know the Lord, nor his works? Do we get the point? The simple reason is this. The generation before them failed them. <laughs> May God help us to understand this in Jesus' name. Brothers and sisters, the chaos in several society today, that people will say, what has changed? What is the problem? Things were not like this. People were living in harmony, there was security and things like that. What has suddenly changed? No, it wasn't, it wasn't a, suddenly, a sudden change. It was because the generation before did not pass on certain things to the next generation. 
or the generation following did not see it fit to buy into the attributes that shape the generation before them. Are you, is the point I'm making clear? In as much as we have responsibility for ourselves, we also have responsibility for those we are bringing up. That is very important. Oh, I'm praying that the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Otherwise, the people that will come after us, they may not in any way reflect who we are. Ah, may God help us in Jesus' name. And let me bring this down to those of us who are parents. Whatever we have not been able to impart to our, to the next generation, be sure that except the Lord help, because God intervenes. Be sure that they are not going to pick it up. And there's no vacuum. They will replace them with some other things. Just read that, that Judges from verse 17. They replace God with idolatry. And then all sorts of crime vices because they are despised they, so, sorry despised the virtues of their fathers may the lord help us in this context in jesus name are you getting the point i'm making this morning is this getting clear to us parents we have a great responsibility No generation just emerge great. Are you getting me? They stand on the shoulders of those who had been before them. Hallelujah. Amen. So that's what I just want us to see there. And by the time you get to chapter 21 of that same passage, the same thing, the last verse of chapter 21 of that same Judges says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own hearts. Can you see that? Everyone was a lord to himself. Whatever I consider right for me is what is right for me. They were not shaped by anything. They had no standard for living. They create their own standard for themselves. That's what it means. May this not be the story of the next generation in the name of Jesus. They just did not have a reference point. I'm praying that God will help us. Let me quickly still pick this generation of, of service. Turn to, with me to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. It wasn't just the generation of Joshua alone that led the legacy of service. There was also the generation of David who led the legacy of service. They sad their generation. They served their nation. They served their country. They served their communities. They served. Hallelujah. No wonder when you read about the mighty men of David, they simply imbibed the spirit of David, who was their leader. Are you getting me? Men who could stand and defend territories. Men who could stand in jeopardy of their life to see the plans and purpose of God done. Men who could stand. Are you following me? Just, they just give themselves to serve, to serve others. 
selfless, sacrificial, committed generation. Amen. Look at that. In Acts chapter 13, the Bible was talking of David after uh, Saul, which was belonged to another generation, and here is David. Uh, verse 22 says, and when he had removed him, that is after God had removed uh, Saul, he raised up for them David to be king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a savior, Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. So you will literally say that the generation, God raised a man called David, whose testimony was a man who will do the will of God. Who will commit himself to service. Service of the people. And we can see that in verse 36. And David, after he had served his own generation, by the will of God, fell asleep and was buried. Hallelujah. Every, so that generation of men of David were generation of servants. They served. They were dutiful. They said God according to the will of God. Which means they would know the will of God and they will follow the will of God and they will serve God according to his will. So they were just selfless people because of what they knew. They served their generation and fell asleep. Don't forget what I said. Every actor has his own time. We didn't wish. They can either serve the purpose of God or not. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. So that was a generation. And men who led that generation, they had influence over their generation. Amen. My time is far spent. Let me take just a, little, a few more minutes, just to tidy this up. Just telling us that a generation is, de is defined by certain attributes. That is some defining characteristics. I will expand more on that another day by the grace of God. What those are. But just looking at few generations there. But let's look at other generations that the scripture described. And it will shock you how some generations were described. Whether you call, call them great or not, you will soon see. But we've seen a great generation and the generation following, not too great. Let's go to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 30. The book of Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. If I'm looking at this kind of generation described there, and I'll pick another generation in the New Testament described by Jesus himself, and we'll look at that, and maybe that will form the template for the next things we'll be doing. But our task in this generation is to emerge a great generation and to raise a great generation. Look at it. Chapter 30 of Proverbs says, and I will read from verse 11. There is a generation that curses his father and does not bless his mother. Wow. What kind of generation will you call that? A generation that has no regard for their parents. Am I, am I uh, making it up by myself? No. So here is a generation 
They are ungrateful. It's an ungrateful generation, an unappreciative generation. A generation without value for their parents. Mm. May we not be described like this. Amen. May the generation of our children not be described like this. Hallelujah. Look at the next one. There is a generation that is pure in, in its own eyes, and yet it's not washed from its filthiness. What kind of generation is that? A generation of hypocrites. Am I wrong in that? Hypocrisy is their, what is their definition. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. A generation that will say one thing and do exactly the opposite. Are you getting it? A generation of hypocrites. Or am I wrong in, the, in that choice of word? But because that's what it is. In their own eyes, they believe they are okay. But nothing is okay about them. Look at the next one. There is a generation, oh how, oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. What is, the, what is the defining attribute for that generation? Pride and arrogance. A pompous generation. Arrogant generation. No respect for anyone, for anything. Pride is the clothes they wear. You can see it in the way they walk. You can see it in the way they talk. You can see it in their attitude. Pride and arrogance. A generation of proud people. The way they walk around, the way they talk about other people, they like to demean other people. Are you following me? These are the kind of generation where you see narcissists. All that is important to them is their own pride. Not any other person. Are you getting what I'm trying to do? They are full of themselves. A generation of people full of themselves. That's another attribute, isn't it? You will tell me whether they are virtues or Vices, we'll talk about that another day. But look at another generation. There is a generation whose teeth are like swords and whose fangs are like knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. Oh, you didn't get, you didn't get that. How will you describe that generation? Does anybody have a word for that generation? What is their defining attributes? Huh? A generation of oppressors. A generation of dictators. A generation without value for life of other people. Isn't it? They don't mind killing, maiming, destroying, if, if that will make them to have their ways. Oh, isn't it? Am I, am I talking from the Bible this morning? And you will see. Look at some nations. And when you see the position of their leaders, you know the kind of generation they are raising and they belong to. A generation where violence is the order of the day. They must have their ways at whatever cost. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. And I round up here very quickly in Matthew 11. But I think, I don't think any one of us will mistake any of these attributes for greatness. Will you? Even if they seem to succeed, even if they seem to, to have some success in court, you will not call them a great generation, will you? All these ones we have just described. 
may we not find the next generation or even our own generation being described as this in Jesus' name. We can extol the virtues of our fathers after they are gone. But what kind of generation are we prepared to be or to lead? It's a matter, it's a solemn matter. I thank God that it's calling, it's coming, this is coming at this solemn time of transition, even in our nation. Jesus said, and I quote him as I close here. Jesus said <laughs> in Matthew 11, Matthew 11, Jesus looked at the generation. He looked at that generation and he looked. Look at the way what he said, verse 16. But to what shall I liken this generation? How can I define this generation? How can I qualify this generation? And look at the outcome of his pondering. It is like children, an immature generation. Are you getting me? A generation full of immature people. They are childish because of certain things you will see in them. Sitting in the marketplace. But is the marketplace a place to sit idle? A generation of I don't care. Very, you know, child, non challenge attitude to anything. And you will soon see that they are like children. No sense of responsibility in them, even when they are in a, in a marketplace, in a place of business. They are not business-minded. They are not business-conscious. They see the marketplace as a playing ground. Look at that. And I'm praying that that is not the kind of generation where people just say, I don't care. Are you getting me? I, I can't be bothered kind of generation. When they should be bothered. Look at what it says. Like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their companions and saying, we played the flute for you. You did not dance. We mourned to you. You did not lament. Is that not an indifferent kind of people? Not to move them. Whoa. And lastly, look at their four. John came neither eating nor drinking. And they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a gluten and a wine biber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is justified by her children. What is that? What does that tell you? Even though they are not doing anything, they know better than those who are doing something. They are a generation of supervisors. They are analysts. They know who is playing well on the field. Generation of critics with no action. Nothing. If you do it this way, they say you, you have overdone it. If you do it this way, they say you are not doing it well. But they are doing nothing. Are you getting the point I'm making? Fault finding generation who take no responsibility for anything. But for the few people who are in action, they like to criticize but they will not play their own role. Are you following me? Have you not seen people sit in football matches and they know how the, the, the person should have taken the ball, dribble and things like that, put them on the pitch. They perform nothing. They even don't understand the game. <laughs> May God help us in Jesus name. We cannot describe a generation that will be great in these terms. And I round up by saying every generation Therefore, it's defined by their views, by their values, by their virtues. 
and by their valiance. I'll talk another day. So these are the things that define the generation. What vision do they have? What are their views? What are the values they extol? What are the virtues they imbibe? Are you following me? And what is it they are courageous and passionate to do? Bow down your head as we pray together. I've taken more time than required, but just to lay this foundation for us. Brothers and sisters, what kind of, how will God define our generation? You are part of a generation and part of a generation. And what are the legacies that our generation is prepared to pass on to the next generation? Are we even doing enough to even pass on something of great legacies to the coming generation? Pray for yourself and pray for your children. Pray for the younger people after us. Pray that we will be a people who will embody the vision of views, the values, the virtues, the values of a great generation. Pray that our children, will, God will give us wisdom on how to transfer this to the next generation. There are things we'll be talking about. We'll be looking at the attributes of a great generation. Pray that you will have that. You will embody that. I will embody that in this new season. And pray for our children. May the Lord help us all in Jesus' name. Have a blessed week. Hallelujah.